Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And Sally, as I do every time I come on, I thank my listeners who come from around the world to listen to the words of wisdom from our authors. And today joining me from Oakland, California is Sally Ornstein. And Sally um, co-authored this book with her husband, Robert Ornstein. And this book is entitled God 4.0 on the nature of higher consciousness and the experience called God. Well, an interesting title, Sally. And um, I want to let our listeners know about your husband and you uh, before we move on. Uh, Robert Ornstein, the award-winning psychologist and pioneering brain researcher, has authored more than 20 books on the nature of the human mind and brain specifically as they uh, involve the two hemispheres, uh, the different modalities, functions, and potentials. Um, Completed just before his death, God 4.0 was a collaboration with Sally, uh, who edited and published the book, then finally published the book. Well, Sally, good day to you. And thank Good you. Day. I know I know you had an interesting uh journey with Robert. And you met in 1981 at the conference in London, the Psychology right, yeah. of Consciousness and Health. Um what really was Bob like and why did you want to finish this kind of it says finished book, but I know you had a lot left to do um after he passed away in December of 2018. Yes, well, to answer your first question, he was brilliant, actually. Um, But unlike a lot of academics, he was emotionally very mature. He had wonderful intuition and was very perceptive. You couldn't lay one over on him. He got you you immediately. So, and he had the most delightful sense of humor. We had a good, we had a good match. It was good. Luckily for me, by the time he died, he had uh, um, understood the neurobiology that he talks about in God 4.0 and come to the key conclusions of the book. Um, As you know from his previous work, he was very, very good at devouring a lot of material from a a lot of fields and really uh, seeing how they connected to each other, different fields. And in this book, he did the same. So it took a while for him to realize that or come to the conclusion that he states in the book that we all have this latent ability for transcendence that can be developed. And that meaning that we can all perceive beyond our normal consciousness. And in fact, we do so to some extent every day without noticing. Yeah, and he did it eloquently, both of you, in this book. And I want to thank you for, you know, finishing it up because it could have been a manuscript that that didn't get out there. Um, But Sally, um, your husband, Bob, or Robert, um, wrote the book. And he said this book is about what it means to go beyond the ordinary perception of reality and to understand why. I think that's important. How, in your estimation, do we as a species, as a human species, connect through our transcendence and make a connection to what he referred in the book as the other, or in this case, God? How do we go about it? I think the first thing we have to do is to, well, two things, really, know what normal consciousness is and then know who we are. Because um, without knowing that normal consciousness is really very, very limited and addresses the survival, it's enabled us to survive very successfully, but it's no longer appropriate for the global problems that we have today. To address the global problems that we have today, we have to, in a sense, go outside of ourselves, uh, which... um, religious teachers often address as shun the world, go beyond normal consciousness and try to get beyond ourselves to a more selfless, more intuitive, expanded perception of our connection to each other. 
Yes. And, you know, there's so much out there today, Sally, around this. Now, I know as being a neuroscientist, it was really interesting. But, you know, look, you look at Michael Pollan's new book, and he writes about people microdosing LSD and various substances to try and go beyond the current consciousness and to make this connection. And we tried to transcend our normal existence in search of these answers, he said, to our perennial questions about the meaning of life and death, because this is really what this is all about. This is why individuals will um, utilize other substances, um, peyote, whatever it might be. Um, how do we expand our consciousness in your in his estimation to better understand our longing to receive answers to those meaningful questions in life, the questions of really meaning the meaning of life? Well, there's a saying that if you sincerely seek truth, truth will find you. So I think the, the, I think the problem of, of ingesting substances or doing practices that you feel might get you somewhere is that you don't really know how to do that without guidance. I think what you have to realize is that, well, what I, uh, in, for myself, I realize that I don't know what truth is. And so if I take something that tells me, well, okay, it's not, the experience is different. I'm having a transcendental experience. I'm outside of myself on peyote or whatever. And, but I've already, I already have expectations of what that journey is like. But if you're looking for truth, one of the, the caveats is, is to go, you have to try and get rid of your assumptions and your expectations and allow the perception to come to you. I think the best um, analogy I can think of is my own experience as a painter. When things go really well, I am not involved. The magic happens. And I don't know what I'm painting about. I don't know what I'm doing exactly. But after, um, when one comes back to normal consciousness, it teaches you. You can understand something about what you've painted that you didn't know you were bothered by or didn't have any insight into. So in, that's in a way that's an analogous to what we're trying to develop. Does that make sense? Yeah, because, you know, the, the people have been experimenting with this and talking about what we're talking about for some time. Um, some of this, the, what I would call benign terms that are being used for it is getting into the flow. Um, yes, and Stephen it's, it's Kotler yes, talks. Yeah. Right. And Stephen yeah. Kotler has been on this show six times and he has the flow mm -hmm. genome project. But the, mm -hmm. but the issue there is, is when, like you said, you got out of the current state and into a new state or into an altered state of consciousness, which the painting fl came through you. You didn't, there was no time. There was nothing. The time you're done, you looked back and you went, wow, look what I created. I didn't create that. Something exactly. beyond me created that. That's the that. point. Yes. That's the point. And That's the point. You have to get your ego out of the way. So even if you realize that you have this intuition, in a sense, you have to ignore it. You really, you really have to keep quiet about it. It doesn't like interference, emotional interference. Right. Now, these two hemispheres of the brain and the neuroscience part of it that uh, Robert spent so much time, how do we open the extra dimension, usually dormant in consciousness, uh, to better know God? I think the, it, it begins by self-knowledge. I mean, there's a story, I don't know whether you know, of a folk, a folk hero called Nasruddin who goes to the goes from his village to the city and he meets the king and he comes back and he says, the king spoke to me. And the villagers say, well, what did he say? And he said, he said, the king said, get out of my way. That's what we have to do. Allow the king to come in and get out of, and get out of its way. Uh -huh. And then the, our actions, our understandings are different. Our, it, it's not something you have to think about. You, you, it just acts through you, if I, if I can 
I don't. It's, yeah, it's and very again, hard. we're we're, it, we're we're talking about consciousness here. We're talking about neuroscience. We're talking about um, how the synapses of the brain actually fires and um, the endorphins released and all the chemicals in the system. But with inside this uh, small little package at the top of our head is really the thing that um, transforms our consciousness to make these connections. And you mentioned that the public, or Robert did, the public discussion of spirituality uh, is often dominated by the extremes, those that think the whole thing's an illusion and the old-fashioned superstition, while the other side maintains that God is everywhere. So if God is everywhere and we are God, how can individuals rationalize this concept? Well, the short answer is they can't. As Bob describes in the book, this is an intuitive perceptive capacity that can be developed, but it's a nonverbal experience that's the result of the the deactivation of certain areas of the brain, areas that keep us in time, space, and with our sense of self, the part of us that's the me first. Normal consciousness is what prophets and spiritual teachers, um, they've consistently told us that we should shun, that in other words, get beyond that. We have to get to a selfless state for right. that to be activated. And, and that can be done through many different practices, contemplation, meditation, prayer, or walks in the wood, Uh, extreme sports we find people finding ways to actually attain this new altered state of consciousness as robert talks about in the book in many different ways and you know um, robert commented on the evolution of our consciousness because that's what we're talking about is the evolution of this consciousness if if we're at a lower level of consciousness to elevate it to a higher level of consciousness and he, and he talked about in a section of the book how shamans played a role by showing us how they entered this ecstatic state of consciousness where spirits can either enter their bodies, I should say, and speak through them. If you would speak with us about the, the shaman experiences and the growth of spirituality and our experiencing uh, God 4.0, because in reality, if you were to take ayahuasca or you were to go to a shaman um, and the shamanistic traditions, you would find that this is where this is being spoken, kind of coming through you. And I bet you when they come out of that state, they don't even realize what they said. Yes, Um Well, in the book, we describe the vision journeys of the shaman, who these ecstatic, as you said, ecstatic meaning outside the self. In a sense, they can be thought of as our original priests. And we talk of the vision journeys as ways in which um, healers, they they survived, really. I mean, 35,000 years ago, we're talking about I know, six people per 40 square miles in in an ice age. I mean, it's incredible circumstances that we went, that we survived. And we must have done this in a way in which um, other modes of consciousness were accessible. It's because it can't have been by trial and error. There weren't enough of, enough of us. So there right. must have been some intuition involved. And in fact, in the book, we talk about um, a contemporary shaman. I don't know whether you remember, but we talk about, um, I think her name was Colin Sombrum, and she's, um, was, um, she got into natural shamanic states when she heard certain drumming and eventually got trained with shamans in Mongolia. And she also is part of a, a, a laboratory that, that is investigating what happens in the brain. And one of the trance states that she got into one of the um, tests that they gave her was to um, with two bowls of water was to come across um, was to intuit which bowl of water had the poison and she could so in a sense that that might in these intuitions 
in a sense, go beyond what we normally experience. But don't forget that, you know, that this is a long, for most of us, this, we emphasize writing. Um, and now in the digital age, you can see children's brains are wired up differently. I mean, our brains are wired up differently. And a lot of the space that now is dealing with Excel sheets and manuscripts like this and trying to put things into words takes up a lot of space. And um, what the book is suggesting is that we need to really allow for solution, for, for um, activities that can, in a sense, provoke this other higher consciousness, because it can be now valuable to us since normal consciousness doesn't in fact serve us, and we can tell that by the mess we're in, frankly, politically. Everybody's out for me first, and unless we get beyond that, there won't be the solutions we need to survive and maintain the planet. Yeah, I concur, and and I think uh, we speak about a topic um, when you look at the um, levels of consciousness, as Ken Wilber talks about, or many different authors speak about. Um, we do have smaller numbers of people that have evolved, but we are seeing more and more evolution in this area. And, you know, you talk about the evolution of consciousness along what Robert referred to as a timeline from God 1.0 to God 4.0. And you reference in the book eras in time, all kinds of eras. You go way back. Um, and how our understanding of God involved. And he stated that in, in it in the 1500 years ago, uh, that we produced a world substantially different from the way it was at the time of the genesis of any of the three monolithic religions, a monolithic religion. And what is our new spiritual literacy in your estimation? What is this, you know, it was spoken about in the book, the new spiritual literacy. I think the new spiritual literacy is something that we have yet to develop. What um, Bob did in the book was to describe how this state of consciousness act is activated neurobiologically. And he got that information from, as you say, people who took drugs from from brain damage, um, people with brain damage and uh, and such like. So we know how it works neurobiologically, and we know that this activation is on a continuum, and that at the far end at say the beginning of the continuum would be when there's an insight, a small insight on how to solve a problem. But at the end of, and then you, you would go to the creative experiences we were talking about and to, for example, Einstein and Ramanuj and those exemplary people who valued intuition and who were remarkable in their own fields. And beyond that, I think with, and this is important, with a lot of discipline and practice, you have the prophets and spiritual teachers. And that doesn't, that activation, that what we distinguish as a higher consciousness in uh, Arabic, it's Insani Kamil, the perfected man, doesn't come easy, but it is in our potential. And what uh, we're saying in God 4.0 is that if this latent faculty becomes known, that if we start to uh, know, know about this faculty, that it can be developed and that we promote the idea of its, of its potential in the world, it will activate it. You can't uh, activate something you know nothing about. So we're saying this is, and, and that's one of the reasons why I was determined to finish the book, because it's so important to know that we have this extra step in our evolution that we need to make. As Bob, Bob said, since the 70s, I think, you can't have, social evolution without conscious evolution. And this is what he's talking about. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, the concept is uh, almost a bit uh, amorphous in the sense that, you know, to tr for listeners to try and get their hands around it, 
So to bring it back in to something um, th that you're asking people to become versus uh, them doing, if there were things that you saw, because Bob spent his life studying the brain and the neurosciences and mm -hmm. um, was very interested in this. Mm -hmm. and, and you have a lot of listeners out there that are probably saying, well, I understand what she's speaking about, but how do I individually take some type of steps toward um, this evolution of my own consciousness? Um, what would you tell them? Because both you and, and Bob um, obviously are extremely high in your levels of consciousness. Um, and it's, it would be something that the listeners, I think, would want to know. Well, as we say in the book, um, and we quote a lot of the, the um, material from the, the, the works of um, the Sufi tradition, for us, the um, understanding that we've gathered through studying the works of Idris Shah and who is the, uh, the latest contemporary teacher of the Sufi tradition. Um, that is where really we've, we've gotten our understanding and that has always been, I expect you know from Bob's work in the past, from the psychology of consciousness onwards, something that has been uh, of importance to him. But again, we're not, we're not authorities on that and we're not saying this is the way you have to go. I mean, mm -hmm. people have to find their own direction, but that is the way through studying Idris Shah's works, the teaching stories that we mention in the book and that are his comments on the teaching stories, Shah himself, we take a long extract in the afterword of the book so that people can clearly see what is in it in the what the teaching stories are and how they might help them and i can talk about that more but that is what bob and i have used to uh, develop this more comprehensive this more perceptive capacity mm -hmm. and and perceptive capacity is a great way to reference it because you know um individuals that are listening today whether they're on a spiritual path or a personal growth path or whatever path they're on, they're seeking. They're seeking something more because they know there's something more. And what your book does is open up the the more to them and how that consciousness can expand. And if you would, speak with us about the difference and independent line of research that confirms how our brains open to enhanced connections to the world, because this was Bob's work. And how does this transcranial direct current stimulation, which you reference it in the book, assist in making the two connections between the two hemispheres of the brain. And does this allow us to experience this out-of-body experience to make a connection with God? Um, well, Bob was quite interested and expert in brain stimulation studies, as you point out. He was also quite clear that studying people with brain injuries, while it can be revealing, um, you've got to be careful what you do. So I don't think, um, and he also points out that um, they're often quite imprecise and not ready for practical application i think that's what you're referring to that that yes in, it's very hard to get a real take on what happens with a, a, an experience of higher consciousness from um, applying an instrument because you're already affected by the actual invasion of the instrument or the the the, the, the fracas going on around you right. so um again i think what 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 really he's talking about precisely is what goes on in the brain that he's no, that he's recorded like for example the deactivation of the default mode network which is a a part of the brain that we all go to when we're doing nothing and it it, it kind of as we say in english it rabbits on it goes on and on and on about 
um, who am I? What do you think of me? Oh, there's the roast burning. I've got to get the children from school, all those things. When right. that is, and that's very much the, the center of what he calls the executive function of the brain that, that puts us, ourself, this self that we need to actually deactivate. It puts it set in the center of it all. Because again, our normal consciousness plus our, our imaginarium, as he calls it in the book, is what, con that, what makes each of us, that's the world we live in. I mean, we all share normal consciousness, but our in imaginarium, our experiences and memories are all different. So um, wh when that is deactivated, when the default mode and the imaginarium is deactivated, that in, in, in the, he, he describes it as the, the, the borders dissolve and the, and the self is diminished in favor of this more holistic approach, this more list a more holistic comprehension in the same way he talks about the right parietal lobe which has a, a, a its function and he, uh, forgive me but i'm not the expert on this and he does describe it so perfectly in the book so i hope readers will uh, take this from the book rather than me but i'll do the best i can the right parietal lobe puts us in in place look uh, it's a location uh, uh um space, time, all the things, all the aspects that keep us locked into the normal world. And that also has to be deactivated right? in order for us to attain this higher consciousness. So you're looking for something that will do that. But again, because we're all individual, the, there has to be some precision. What works for somebody in like, for example, in the 13th century, Jalaluddin Rumi, the Sufi mystic and poet, used to um, had in Konya whirling dervishes, right? Now, he, he uh, prescribed the whirling of the dervishes because he was dealing with a community that was quite phlegmatic. You wouldn't put, you wouldn't prescribe that with Western, with America today because we tend to be over emotional. So you have to find another way of quieting, of not feeding that emotionality, but going in another direction in order to develop this consciousness through a quieter means. And um, as I said, for us, for Bob and I, the, the quieter means is to, in, is to familiarize ourselves with these teaching stories from the Sufi tradition collected for this time and these circumstances by Idris Shah. Yes, Idris Shah. Well, I think, Sally, then what you really have um, highlighted here is that we're all individuals, number one, and number two, the experience is a holistic one, um, that we don't need to alter our consciousness with uh, drugs or other things to uh, elevate this consciousness to this level. The key is to be able to not only move to the new level of consciousness, but to stay there um, and have it become part of our being. And if Absolutely. you were to leave, if you were to leave our listeners with the three important points regarding God 4.0, what would they be and how can they elevate their consciousness to have a deeper connection in this case, God 4.0 kind of connection? Um, personally, they're, they're out there listening. They understand. They understand that this is available to them. They understand they want to take a holistic approach to it. Um, you were talking about the, the various uh, things that they could read. Is there anything in particular that you would recommend that they go to read, resource, reference? Um, what might you tell them? Well, they, they could start with God 4.0. <laughs> well, they're going to read God 4.0 because okay. we're going to put it up there. And you have a huge addendum here uh, okay. in the book with all kinds of references that Robert made when he was uh, writing the book. And I was just curious if there were and when you look at the references, um, you know, he talks with Rumi, the way of the Sufis, uh, the case of God, and it goes on and on and on. 
and I guess maybe just let them reference those particular uh, elements of the book, including the addendum. Yeah. I think the afterward is is the afterward is is key to what uh, which is written by Idris Shah, um, which describes the teaching story um, more succinctly than either Bob or I could, which is why we included it. Well, it's the, Shah, be... it's the Idris Shah, it's the foundation.org. So for my listeners, this is I-D-R-I-E-S-S-H-A-H foundation.org. Idris Shah Foundation is for further readings. It's listed in the book, but I wanted to give it to them and we will put a link in our blog for that as well. Now going yes. back now going back to this, um, what would you what would you want to leave our listeners with? Three important points. I think that it's about experience. It's about a nonverbal experience that will direct your life, and that will enable you to understand much more than you than you currently do, and that it is possible to develop, and that the provo provoking it. Um, starts with knowing who we are, starts with understanding what normal consciousness is, and the experience of creativity, problem solving, those intuitions that you get are part of that continuum that leads to this higher perception. But again, well, it's, it's about experience, so it's very hard to, it's just, I mean, yes. It happens to all no, of us, but no, I understand. You know, it's it's intuition. I wrote a book on intuition, so I understand it well. And I think the the things that we do to prepare ourselves to have greater levels of intuition or opening of our consciousness or understanding that it's available, um, as I mentioned, you know, fifteen minutes ago, it's. You know, it's deep contemplation, it's meditation, it's walks in the woods, it's doing things that takes that part of the brain, which is constantly clicking and keeping you in what I would call either the dead past or the imagined future, because you're thinking about things that happened yesterday or things you have to do tomorrow. And if you can learn to stay in this state of now, um, as we've talked about, many famous authors write about, I think that is the starting point uh, to actually access this highest level of uh, of consciousness. And um, I don't know if you agree with that, but I would think that you probably would. I think being in the present, in the sense that the ordinary world is a is a a bridge to that higher consciousness so being in the present is certainly important well i think the buddhists used to talk about the delusion and the maya and the reality is is the rest of the world is the maya and the delusion um and to get out of that requires that we understand that we're in it so the first element is awareness and i think so many people don't actually even have that level of awareness um, so first, A, number one is awareness. And after the awareness is finding things that we can do to alter the state of consciousness, to access a higher level of intuition, and then a connection with God. Um, agreed? God being our higher consciousness. God Correct. being state of mind. Yes. yes. I yes. think that's so, but it is, um, you know, it is quite subtle and uh, one can't have, it's not exactly like um, as we're used to. You can't sort of pay your money and get it immediately. So it's a long road. <laughs> oh, I that think. that's for certain. I think people, shamans, spiritual, spiritual teachers, um, people that have been going down this path, it's all a unique experience at each one of them. And I think it's at the intersection frequently where it happens. We see it happen as many people that have had near-death experiences come the closest, but then are able to come back from that and actually give an account of those kind of things. Um, those, those experiences actually do 
get people to shift and transform their consciousness uh, most of the time, most of the time. So yes, but the, what we what we what we need to work on is how do we get this higher consciousness to inform our actions in the everyday world? Yes, that's the I agree. key. That's the I, key. It has to be something that's developed and works in parallel. It's not about giving up something, or it's about making making room for, and it informs our choices. I mean, intuitively, you know, for example, what not to do and what what to do as bob would used to say we have no idea sometimes whether because we took a left it saved us from a, 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 an accident if we'd taken a right you know it's sort of on that we have no idea a lot of the time that intuition that perceptive capacity is working but it is working and uh, we can develop it most certainly well sally it's been a pleasure having you on inside personal growth and for my listeners um we've been talking with uh, Sally Ornstein and the book is God 4.0. We'll put a link uh, to uh, Amazon. It's on the nature of higher consciousness and the experience called God. Um, If you want to take a deeper dive into this, uh, Robert has done a wonderful job of giving you kind of a roadmap here, giving you history and talking about the neuroscience of it as well, along with the spirituality of it. And uh, I think the book is extremely well done and gives the reader an opportunity to take a dive and understand more. And uh, Sally, thanks for you sticking in there after Robert's death and actually completing the book and getting it published, bringing it out to the public. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you for having me. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk about it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.